Okay, welcome back. Good morning, good evening, uh, uh, future uh, uh, participants. So uh, it's a great honor for us today to invite uh, Professor uh, Yishi Chao to give us uh, the second lecture. So um, uh, yesterday we have a very uh, special beginning and our Dean uh, Shang Ning Li also make an opening speech for the uh, doctor consortium uh, program we set up this year. So I want to start sharing my screen to briefly introduce the uh, introduce the program. Yes, here. Um, every year, actually, we have a, a doctor consortium and we want to share them with the world. So this year, from um, uh, June the thirteenth to uh, July the 2nd, we uh, organized the PhD consortium again. So this year we actually uh, organized three sequence and um, all based on the topic of this year, one planet. Actually uh, the first uh, sequence, which is about the philosophy and theory of architecture. And the second uh, uh, sequence, which is about uh, the design thinking and the performance-based design. And the third one is all um, uh, made by Patrick Schumer. He wants to uh, give us some introduction about the new framework of his understanding of architecture from parametricism to the metaverse um, architecture manifesto. I think we are looking forward to all these uh, lectures. Uh, so welcome, join us and register uh, 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 from uh, uh, anywhere in the world. So uh, you're welcome to join us. Actually, the PhD consortium, the motivation is trying to produce the new um, uh, knowledge system, which is uh, sharing on Bilibili YouTube and the Metaverse platform. And in the future, we're looking forward to different teams from different universities they can assemblage, assemble all these kinds of lectures uh, from their own research academic motivation. And I think it's a new way of learning because it is booming. Uh, all the new knowledge, uh, philosophy and uh, theory, actually we need to learn, we need to uh, uh, find the details, how to, uh, uh, one knowledge system is influenced by another. So I think it's new ways of uh, learning, especially for the PhD student. So um, PhD students, so uh, it's a great honor to invite so many uh, uh, expertise uh, who uh, are very generous sharing uh, their thinking and uh, uh, their knowledge to, to, to all of us. And the second I want to also introduce is um, uh, Digital Futures already, this is the 12th year, the 12th year uh, 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 for the events we organized. And this year, I think what is new is we try to uh, launch uh, a new uh, journal uh, named uh, Architecture Intelligence. Um, on 26th of June, uh, we want to um, uh, uh, launch the inaugural issue. Uh, uh, we have 15 um, uh, ethics, uh, 15 papers, which based on the peer review um, process, including um, Matthias uh, De Campo, uh, Mara Capo, Neil Leach, and Patrick Schumacher, Mark Scheer, and uh, Matt Thompson, uh, uh, so and so forth. We have a lot of very influential um, uh, academic uh, people contribute uh, their thinking. Some of them are review papers, some of them are uh, uh, research papers, and including like Archimangus introduced the pavilion, uh, Venice Biennale Pavilion which based on the robotic fabrication and also the cover image is from Akim's team. And Roland Snook introduced his thinking on the swarm intelligence uh, uh, theory, how to implement them in the robotic fabrication uh, scenarios, so on and so forth. I think it's, we're looking forward uh, to find a new uh, research method which based on the scientific uh, thinking uh, and also we test all these kinds of possibilities by the experiments and by the scientific research process. So that's the motivation for this 
uh, special uh, this journal. So looking forward, all the PhD uh, candidates, uh, you can contribute uh, your design and also participate and engage uh, in this uh, special community. And Shi Qiao, uh, I want to also briefly introduce uh, 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 Shi Qiao again, uh, who is the Whedon Professor in Asian Architecture, School of Architecture, University of Virginia, where he teaches history, theory, and design of architecture and directs the PhD program in the Constructive Environment program. He studied architecture at Tsinghua um, uh, in Beijing and got a bachelor's degree and also obtained his PhD from AA School of Architecture and Brickback, um, uh, a Birk Birkbeck uh, College, University of London. Uh, prior to join University of Virginia, uh, Lee practiced architecture in London and Hong Kong and taught at AA School of Architecture, National University of Singapore, and the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Some of his design research and teaching is featured in Topological Drift, Emerging City in Architecture, and, uh, the, um, uh, uh, and also his scholarly research is on cultural framework of cities and how they function as reflexive urban theory. His book includes Against uh, Autology, uh, and which one he introduced yesterday, and I'm looking forward to read it, which based on the, his uh, Chinese uh, thinking, his research on the Chinese thought and uh, uh, Francois uh, Julian. And another book I already uh, read, which is super um, elegant reading, uh, uh, writing, uh, named uh, Our Understanding the Chinese City, which is an extremely important um, uh, uh, theoretical book and uh, introduce the Chinese mm -hmm. cities from the culture and the philosophy pr perspective. And another uh, book, Architecture and uh, Modernization, which is written in Chinese, and also Power and Virtue, Architecture and Intellectual Change in England. Uh, 16 city to 1730. He served as a chair of the Department of Architectural History at University of Virginia, uh, international jury for RBA President's Medal for uh, dissertations, and he is also the member of visiting committee of Harvard GSD. So that's the uh, brief background. And yesterday, she named the Indo uh, European and the uh, Cynetic Divergence. And today, in the second lecture named the Indo European Linguistic. Uh, and tomorrow, uh, also, uh, he will the third lecture uh, Shapes and Patterns, the Language of uh, Similitude. Uh, this series of three lectures attempts to reshape the discussion on the multi uh, uh, facts connects between the language and architecture. He argues that the current norms of language architecture connections, semiology, uh, space syntax, uh, shape grammar, pattern language, codes, algorithms, autopoiesis, uh, which are almost uh, 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 exclusively constructed within the Indo-European uh, Indo linguistic philosophical tradition. From these norms, theory, speak for, rather than think with, non-Indo-European linguistic philosophical traditions. This narrows the intellectual resources available to us. Although the Indo-European uh, languages make up the largest language family in the world today. And the second largest language family is Sino-Tibetan, with Chinese have the largest number of native users in the world. Yet, despite the, the diversity of languages, our world have been, um, has been a result of what Devi um, Authony called the greatest Indo-European linguistic philosophical takeover from five, uh, 4,500 BCE onwards. The set of the three languages traces the broad 
tragedies of the Indo-European linguistic philosophical expansion throughout the world, explains the moral and aesthetic diver divergence uh, between the Indo-European and the Sinaitic linguistic constructs. The, specu uh, the, the speculates and the speculates on how language architecture connects can be reconstituted to include both the Indo-European and the Sinaitic uh, language. So we're looking forward to uh, Shi Chao second lecture named uh, Phenocentrism, the Indo-European linguistic philosophy constructs. Welcome, uh, Shi Chao. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, uh, everyone attending the lecture uh, very early in the morning. Um, I, um, I was quite excited to talk about uh, the basic uh, um, outline and in a kind of introductory lecture yesterday about uh, the um, idea and the understanding of a language family that became far more than just a language family. It was, it became a kind of expansive uh, civilization and how do you understand uh, where did the civilization come from and what they used to uh, build itself and then how they expanded. The idea here is not, um, I, I think there are two important points that's worth emphasizing that this is really not a, a, a series of lectures to say that language equals architecture. And I think that's the dead end that the uh, you know, linguistic theories of architecture in the 1980s and 1990s in the world of architectural theory. And that's how they hit that dead end, that, that the thinking was a little bit too rigid. Uh, so, so what we're thinking about today here is really the relationship between language thought, and through that, um, uh, the impact on architecture. And the second thing to mention is that this is really not a effort to kind of diminish one culture and, you know, to, and to promote another, you know, nothing is diminished here. And what really is talked about is basically to understand uh, with some depth, and some details and some history and, and some intellectual insights, both sides, so that we can actually sustain something like a gap between them, not to equate them 100%, not to kind of explain one through the lens of the other, but you understand both so that we can see that there's a gap and that gap becomes um, uh, the most productive space for us to think about architecture. Let me just start um, to share today's lecture. Can you see it? Yes, you can see it. Yeah. Is it okay? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so lecture to phonocentrism, uh, the Indo-European linguistic philosophical construct. And somewhat uh, to everyone, this is actually quite familiar because postmodernism takes up this idea quite seriously. And, you know, of course we think about Derrida uh, famously using this term to describe uh, phonocentrism. But here, what I want to take us to is probably a little bit, um, kind of more expansive to include more content and more understanding on, uh, you know, on the one hand, the, the kind of Indic side of the Indo-European civilization, but on the other hand, also the, the Chinese side so that, so that we can see that gap and where the gap is formed and how it's formed. Phonocentrism uh, is, I don't know, it's, it's probably a little abstract uh, way to really under, to, to describe, uh, a, I would say a very particular phenomenon in uh, uh, human civilization, 
uh, if you like, that there was there has been uh, within the Indo-European um, linguistic and philosophical context a huge desire to maintain the central position of speech, the spoken word. And, and you know, this is, I mean, I, I have to quickly kind of say that this is really not about, you know, every language has spoken form and, and some kind of written form. So uh, this is really about the relative importance rather than uh, in absolute terms. Yesterday, I mentioned uh, Rick Vader, uh, Rick Vader being uh, probably the most important ritual text, hymns um, uh, in the um, in the that that that's that's the you know that was kind of practiced and recited uh, repeatedly uh, over thousands of years in India, and it was composed, uh, you know, from the best kind of guess. Uh, around 1400 to 1000 BCE was, uh, was probably only written, uh, uh, we believe in 1000 AD. You're really talking about, you know, a few thousand years between what was kind of a really highly elaborate and sophisticated text entirely spoken and transmitted orally generations of the generation um, and, and the, the, the written form that really uh, have happened much, much later. Uh, so the earliest written uh, Rig Veda text um, that we have today uh, dates back to 1646. Um, when you actually look at the um, content of the Rig Veda, and you also realize that, that, that this insistence on oral transmission and oral tradition was not an accident, and it was a deliberate choice to keep it oral. And, um, and Rig Veda uh, frequently describes speech as identical with cosmic and divine breath. So breathing, breathing in and out, it really is the, the kind of energy of life. Uh, if you think about uh, the whole, you know, kind of life, um, uh, uh, how life functions. And that particular understanding of breathing in and out becomes uh, kind of integrated with an understanding of a divine force that, you know, that needs to be kept operating. And, uh, and that's how this whole understanding of the divine speech um, yeah. uh, came to be um, understood in the Rig Veda. Uh, many centuries later, and each Veda, there are four Vedas in, uh, in, uh, in the um, uh, Rig Veda. Um, uh, each one comes with some kind of commentaries later on, centuries after uh, the original older text. And Chandogya Upanishad, they're called Upanishads. Um, uh, Chandogya Upanishad was probably one of the oldest uh, Upanishads that's attached to uh, the Vedic text. And, and there you also find really interesting, a very vivid description of you know, what speech uh, meant for uh, those ancient people. Uh, and for example, um, and in Chandogya Upanishad, and you find sentences like essence of man is speech, speech and breath, the rig and the saman, each of these sets clearly is a pair of inchoitus, and this pair of inchoitus unites in the syllable om, and when the pair unites in inchoitus, they satisfy each other's desire. So this is really kind of understood as a kind of almost like a biological uh, phenomenon that breathing, uh, speech and the person's being 
are so deeply intertwined. Uh, and you always begin, you know, with, um, or you always began with, with the syllable OM. And I don't know, like today, if we go to a yoga practice and at least, you know, a little bit more authentic ones and you start chanting with um, the syllable OM as well. Um, so the consequence of that kind of uh, emphasis on speech, uh, this is really uh, something that certainly needs a lot more study, but I find it really interesting that that, that kind of emphasis on speech, on uh, kind of, you know, phonetically sustaining words uh, um, became uh, expanded through the different locations of use of words and the change of word forms, the, the, the introduction of, um, uh, of numbers, of gender, of uh, past, present, and future, and so on and so forth. And that, that contributed to an extremely complex uh, grammar, um, very, very completely developed uh, in the Sanskrit language. Uh, here's some statistics and there are 40, 52 letters and 16 vowels and 36 consonants. The noun has eight grammatical cases, uh, normative, accusative, and genitive, and those who actually studied, you know, at least one form of Indo-European language, and you would have this kind of cases. Very difficult for, I guess, the, the people who are used to uh, Chinese uh, usage and, and speech, but, um, but I think it's very natural when you're in that mode of learning uh, to speak languages in this context. The three numbers, singular, double, plural, three genders, masculine, feminine, neuter. Uh, these are very common with a lot of, you know, French, Italian, um, German and so on, uh, they, they all have this. Um, Sanskrit verb uh, also is complex as I, you, he, she, it, uh, three persons, three doubles, we, two, you, two, they, two, three plurals, we, all, you, all, they, all, and three past tenses, uh, imperfect, uh, orist, and perfect. Like, you know, I was doing it, I did it, I've done it. So, so these are kind of different shades of grammatical shades that are really amazingly refined. Uh, so this is really what's so uh, kind of shocking for uh, European colonizers going to India and discovering that this language is amazing. Um, so um, that really is not the end, you know? Phono, I mean, like the emphasis on oral transmission of knowledge, uh, the use of really sophisticated grammatical markers uh, created, um, I want to argue that a way of kind of create, a way of building up uh, knowledge and understanding of values that are, that are, that are that are constructed around the spoken word, uh, truth, and ultimately the, the idea of God. Um, uh, you know, those who are familiar with the, the um, uh, Vedic tradition, um, you have uh, the, the, the truth uh, is sometimes known as um, Brahman, and then you have Brahman who uh, are actually the poet and the priest who would formulate the truth orally again and again so that it doesn't leave, the truth doesn't leave the body. It doesn't jump from the body onto your page. And so that really is um, uh, a very important um, commitment uh, to, to knowledge. Um, um, uh, Jamieson and uh, Brereton, uh, the two scholars who actually translated the complete uh, uh, Veda text, uh, it's published in 2014, very recently. Uh, uh, I think it's the first complete English translation. And they, they argued that it is also, you know, this kind of oral tradition is also 
to state the truth of these heroic deeds that's embodied in the Vedic uh, uh, stories and, and, and the, um, that was the, the content of the uh, of Vedic chants, uh, so that these deeds will become real once again. So by speaking it, they become real uh, again and again. So, you know, there was, and if you <laughs> try to think with the ancient uh, Vedic tradition, uh, these words should never leave the mind and should never uh, not, should, should always be spoken continuously. Uh, uh, same is, you know, there's a kind of ritual of drinking a stimulant uh, drink called soma. Uh, of course, that is also, it's part of the Vedic ritual. And that, of course, is pressed, soma is pressed uh, with the real words of truth, with trust and with fervor. Words, commitment, and ritual all uh, combine to make the soma real. It is really extremely interesting. Uh, this is something that Derrida uh, mentioned uh, in his uh, book of grammatology. And yesterday we talked about, you know, philosophy, grammar, and grammatology, and that kind of understanding of the Western philosophy in that particular line of thinking. Uh, that there was really interesting story that was kind of related by Plato in his Phaedrus. Uh, in Phaedrus, uh, Plato had Socrates telling a story of uh, a Greek king um, being uh, presented with the first piece of writing. Here's what, um, sorry, the Egyptian, sorry, the Egyptian king uh, uh, being presented the first piece of writing, here's what he said. That so you have discovered an elixir not of memory, but of reminding. To your students, you give them an appearance of wisdom, but not the reality of it. Thanks to you, they will hear many things without being taught them and will appear to know much when for the most part, they know nothing. They'll, uh, they will be difficult to get along with because they have acquired the appearance of wisdom instead of wisdom itself. So, uh, Think about this, you know, this is really kind of one of the really interesting first reactions in the Greek tradition uh, to writing that, that when things are written down and then it's transmitted, uh, it really is an, it seems that here that there was, that was an act of faking memory um, so that, you know, you're kind of using to, I mean, we don't think about today anymore, but it was really I mean, to me, it's really extremely interesting to, to think about um, this uh, very old piece of writing from Plato uh, talking about um, writing and speech in this way. We continued writing, Fergus, has this strange quality and is very like painting. For the creatures of painting stand like living beings, but if one asks them, question, they preserve a solemn silence. So there's no dialogue here. Uh, so it is with the written words. You might think that they spoke as if they had intelligence, but if you question them, wishing to know about their sayings, they always say only one and the same thing. And every word, when once it is written, is uh, banded about the like, among those who understand and those who have no interest in it, and it knows not to whom to speak or not to speak when ill-treated or unjustly reviled, it always needs its, uh, its father to help it, as father as you know, the person who wrote it, and for it has no power to protect and help itself. So uh, you may think that this is a mentioned sensibility, and if you actually read this book called Orality and Literacy by a, a rather well-known um, philosopher uh, and philologist, uh, Walter Arn, um, this was really written in, in, the, in late 20th century. 
uh, um, a book on the importance of uh, the oral tradition. And um, here's what, um, you know, this is kind of uh, how I summarized um, the water arms kind of anxiety over the loss of the oral tradition because the technologies of writing in the 20th century had become so sophisticated and so prevalent that he felt necessary uh, to write this book, to defend the oral tradition, that, that this is really kind of almost like repeating what Plato just said, uh, that, uh, that the, the writing is almost like an invoking death, uh, you know, because the knowledge is dead when it's written down, it's not alive. And such things, uh, he says, are not so readily associated with magic, for they are not actions, uh, uh, but are in a radical sense dead, um, through, uh, though subject to dynamic resurrection. So when you read a book, the words become alive, but then, you know, uh, but then maybe uh, they, they come alive in a, in a different way. Uh, Writing is also some kind of isolation. And writing is, um, he says that he says the sight isolates, sound incorporates. So sight is, you know, like when you read writing, that's that's an act of isolation. You read in silence. You read uh, in isolation. Uh, so that which is complaint. And also, like Plato, and he says that there was an autonomous discourse in writing when it's written, it's gone away from your head, and then it is doing whatever it wants to do, and you have no control over it. You know, there's no way directly to refute the text, and the text doesn't respond, basically. After absolutely uh, total and devastating refutation, it says exactly the same thing as before. So, so this is like, kind of, you know, repeating what Plato just said. Um, so, so, you know, across this a few thousand years, uh, you, you, you can see that that kind of enthusiastic defense of the oral tradition uh, hasn't really gone away, despite the prevalence of writing uh, and, and development of the writing technologies uh, that we have today. It actually is also, um, you know, that sentiment um, across a, a very uh, long period of history, particularly during the year of European colonization around the world. Um, and that sentiment, uh, I think, I believe, played a major role in terms of um, how the Europeans uh, thought about the structures of world civilization, the hierarchies of, uh, of uh, uh, cultures, the hierarchy of races and so on, and played a role in that. And I give you a, almost like a buffet of uh, a selection uh, of um, uh, maybe some of the key works in Western philosophy and thinking uh, starting from Francis Bacon, uh, who wrote in a very important book, actually the Advancement of Learning, 1605, and the book that laid out a modern picture uh, uh, of what um, knowledge structure should look like. And he said he, he made a very clear distinction between the hieroglyphic and the alphabetic. And, and basically um, saying that there's, a, there's an order and the alphabetic is uh, far more superior. It is really uh, um, hieroglyphic is, is a primitive form uh, of language and then of the, the alphabets uh, certainly replaced hieroglyphics um, to become our current language of philosophy. Hegel was one person who fiercely 
defended the uh, oral tradition of um, of certainly German, uh, you know, that was his point that, that that civilization reached the height in Bavaria in, in Germany and, uh, and the rest of the world basically fell behind. And this was his way of understanding world history and maybe justifying European colonization so that they bring uh, civilization uh, to backward cultures. Uh, so, so this is what he said about Chinese language or writing. The nature of their writing language, written, the nature of their written language is at the outset a great hindrance to the development of, of the sciences. Rather, conversely, because a true scientific interest does not exist, the Chinese have acquired no better instrument for representing and imparting thought. So uh, clearly, you know, he had a lot more to say about the um, Inadequate, inadequacies of the Chinese language. Uh, I'm not going to repeat that, but in the theory, in the same spirit. Uh, here's uh, Walter on again. There can be no doubt that the characters will be replaced by the Roman alphabet, despite the fact that um, the loss of literature will be enormous. He was talking about Chinese here, uh, that the Chinese, he had no doubt, will be. From, uh, fanaticized and will be replaced with uh, Roman uh, alphabet. Uh, Eric Havelock, another philosopher, uh, and when when he was really he was when he was discussing the relative merits of Chinese characters in the Greek alphabet, and he had no doubt that that the Greek alphabet is the best possible form of language, and then the Chinese character will eventually be phased out. Um, and lastly, I, I mentioned him a little bit yesterday, uh, William Hannes, uh, uh, in this book, the book, book title actually says uh, a lot. And the book title is called The Writing on the Wall, How Asian Orthography Curbs Creativity. His, his, his thesis is that because of the difficulty of, uh, of remembering the words and, and the large amount of memory that's required for people to learn the language and people become so rigid and uh, culture becomes so disciplined that you cannot really have genuine creativity. And he said there's the high degree of redundancy, uh, graphic redundancy as in, you know, because he's, he, he actually sees Chinese language as a, as a kind of uh, elaborate form and it's a kind of incomplete form of alphabetic language. So, so the, the Chinese writing becomes redundant. And of course the alphabet is more efficient and the endless procession of monosyllabic morphemes and the failure to transcend concrete world of perceived phenomena. Uh, so as you can see that that there has been not only a military economic kind of colonization uh, in the past century, say 400 years um, in European history, um, but also a cultural crusade uh, to, 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 to kind of, you know, borrow a term of religious wars um, that, that, that really was charged with this kind of sentiment. Uh, to to say that you know uh, you you've, <laughs> you've got it totally wrong. <laughs> let, let us tell you how to do things. So um, I you know this is really of course you know we, this uh, 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 this kind of colonizing um, process doesn't exist in radical form anymore, but subtly. Uh, you know, in kind of um, um, almost like a hidden forms, uh, it still is with us. You know, it, you, you sometimes from time to time you get these comments um, uh, by intellectuals and in popular culture uh, on um, the use of language um, that really reflects uh, similar uh, sentiments. So here's kind of, you know, I mean, I kind of is a quick sketch 
of uh, of a long tradition, uh, beginning perhaps with the Vedic uh, um, texts, the Vedic um, oral tradition, and to the recent um, defense of um, the alphabet and the oral language um, uh, and, and the, the kind of presence of, uh, of speech, um, you can understand that there has been uh, a long running uh, enterprise uh, to maintain it, to defend it, and to spread it. Um, so what are the language, what are the kind of thought language implications? And to go back to the term that we used yesterday, uh, thought language. And I want to um, maybe begin to uh, lay out uh, a series of um, uh, civilizational features, um, beginning with a very clear, really fascinating um, imprisonment conception. And that was very, very clearly manifested in the Vedic tradition. The idea was basically to understand life as a form of imprisonment in material uh, uh, limitations. And I guess it's, you know, you find it in Buddhism and this is something that, that we are all very familiar with, and, and, and there the understanding of life is a life of some kind of suffering, and you know the life then becomes a process uh, through which you attain um, happiness in, in a different world. So that imprisonment conception uh, was very early, and Buddhism um, happened much later when, in relation to the early Vedic period. In the early Vedic period, which is 1500 to 1100 BCE, and one could already um, clearly see the conception of three spheres, the earth, the intermediate region, and sky. So this is really a kind of proto-conception of heaven, of uh, another world. Um, that, that, that you aspire to and you can kind of escape your current suffering and, and be transmitted or, you know, transferred or uh, uh, risen to, uh, to a better world. In later Vedic period, it was 1100 to 500 BCE, and things got a little bit more complicated. I think this is probably also uh, in the case of Buddhism, that you have layers and layers of uh, ascension uh, to um, the pure land and to, uh, to the, the best possible world that, that you can imagine from the earth. You know, earth is always the place to run away from um, and, and not the place to stay. So associated with that imprisonment conception, um, is, is, is the promise and fear of heaven and hell. Um, and we talk about Buddhism and, you know, there's uh, certainly a lot of imagery uh, in Buddhism uh, uh, on, um, uh, in relation to pure land and how it would look and who would be in it and you know, what kind of life you would be living and so on and uh, vivid imagery of how you would be punished if you don't really follow certain rules and, and so on and so forth. Um, so these are kind of really um, fundamental. Uh, I'm talking about this because, because in the <laughs> ancient uh, Chinese conception, you don't really find clear, you know, clear understanding of this, this uh, divide between um, heaven, earth, and hell. Uh, um, so here is, uh, I mean, in Chinese, there's kind of yin, jie, and, you know, the, the territory of yin and the territory of yang, but uh, that's probably it. Um, 
the European Renaissance has been a period in which this vivid imagination of heaven and earth and punishment and reward became so visualized and so um, well uh, represented and because of the naturalist painting techniques that they developed in Italy and that you have uh, incredible paintings of the city of God um, uh, here in the 14th century and you have Dante writing the divine comedy uh, with commentaries uh, of, um, um, of you know, heaven and hell. And particularly his description of hell was just so uh, uh, memorable. <laughs> this, is, this is Sandro Botticelli's uh, painting, uh, the map of hell, hell uh, according to uh, Dante's uh, uh, description of the, the layers and layers and layers of suffering. Uh, if you don't, and and some uh, another image of um, uh, of heaven and hell in Basilica di San uh, Petronio in Bologna. Um, in Florence, Giorgio Vasari and the Last Judgment, the, the, the kind of judgment scenes uh, were painted in the Renaissance over and over again by pretty much all major um, uh, painters uh, during that time. And they created a very vivid imagery um, of, of heaven and hell. Uh, that really, had a huge impact in terms of how uh, human life is understood um, in terms of that whole kind of abstraction process of you know, what, it, what it appears to you materially around you is actually not the end of the story. You know, the real story happened somewhere above you and, and, and somewhere that's kind of abstracted from you. Um, that's something that's, um, in a way, uh, parallels that kind of linguistic structure of, of abstracting a concept from a thing uh, that we described yesterday. Um, as a result, and you know, I was always wondering, um, particularly when you look at uh, the burial sites of different cultures, and, and, and I was also always struck by how rich, elaborate, uh, and how um, uh, profuse of the, the burial objects uh, are in like Egyptian, Mayan and Chinese terms. And these are the <laughs> people who actually have hieroglyphic languages and somehow they have shape-based thought language that uh, I was I was making an argument that 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 the language is actually much closer to things than yesterday. Uh, the Han people, for example, in China, they worried about the soul leaving the body and and of the dead, and and the dead had to be kind of entertained and made happy and comforted by material things. And that's why they put lots of things in their tombs. And to the extent that our knowledge of the Han Dynasty, a lot of it came from or come from the, um, the burial objects. And in contrast, if you look at the Vedic burial rituals, uh, cremation was the main main method, you know, this is basically nothing because you ascend to somewhere else, you know, this material world, this world of objects and world of desires and world of materials that are not as important as the world that you are about to ascend to. So um, uh, that's, that's certainly uh, something that has enormous impact on how cities and spaces are designed. Um, another um, major practice here, uh, I guess, to uh, sustain the distinction between 
the abstracted perfect world and the, the, the less desirable world of suffering and imprisonment is really the, the, the process of purification. You know, there's uh, in, in many of the Indo-European religions, uh, you have conceptions of dirtiness and purification. And this is very clear in the Vedic tradition and the Vedic ritual and the ultimate um, purification is the pur purification through fire, Agni is the god of fire, uh, as, as purification. That's why, in a way, uh, the dead were burned, uh, not so much to kind of, you know, reduce um, the corpse to nothing, but more like to purify the dead so that they can then ascend to a different higher world. Uh, the idea that we are polluted, whether it's a kind of Buddhist notion of, you know, of the desire that we have and we need to get rid of, or in the Christian sense of the original sin, and there's always this kind of pollution uh, that's around us and we need to overcome. Historically, uh, Zoroastrianism is actually a very important, a very fascinating development religiously. And, and we, we don't have a large uh, Zoroastrian communities in the world today, but historically it was a very important religious development to move from um, uh, many, many gods, which was in the Vedic tradition, but also in the Greek, uh, uh, ancient Greek uh, um, culture. Uh, to one God, uh, to monotheism. This is one, you know, so, so uh, I guess it's really, um, it has a, has a much greater focus, if you like, uh, and the purification became uh, very much intensified and fire was central uh, to the Zoroastrian uh, purification. Uh, there are many, many rituals that, um, uh, that that um, that maintain or signify, and like the priest who would cover your nose and face a bit like what we use today to cover our nose and, and face to ward off uh, um, viruses. They cover their face to think that you actually your breath your 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 breathing is is already not pure. You know, so they have to kind of. Um, uh, get rid of uh, traces of the human, so that you can imagine a god in a uh, as as a as as a god of purity, as a god of good against evil and and brightness against darkness. Fascinating Zoroastrianism. The god is called Uhura Master, and he is a. Uh, stone carving uh, of the image uh, of God uh, in action. So uh, today, the ritual of purification exists uh, both in baptism or in the, in, in the kind of washing ritual before you go uh, into a mosque um, that, um, that are kind of traces of that ancient tradition. Uh, uh, one of the most interesting kind of contemporary philosophical development, thinking about all this uh, kind of conception of imprisonment and liberation and the process of purification to make that happen, uh, is really to think about Latour's characterization of modernization as purification, as if that particular feature in the Euro in the European civilization was picked on as a major uh, kind of instrument to, um, to create systems of knowledge that, that are kind of purified and to the extent that, that they become something that we now describe as modern, um, you know, not only modern knowledge, but also modern architecture with its clean and unadorned surfaces and materials and you know, as a work of purification. Um, and this is, this is, a, this is a, the famous diagram that comes from Latour's, we've never been modern. Uh, 
if you haven't read it, then I highly recommend that you, you, you read it. And because this has a really um, good description of, of what we have done culturally, at least in the Indo-European civilization, um, uh, in terms of knowledge production. Um, because of the dirtiness and the suffering of the world, uh, of the material world, uh, uh, the first act in response to the suffering, in response to the possible ascension to the pure land and to, to the higher world of purity uh, is renunciation. You know, you have to, it really is so fundamental uh, to the whole act of believing in all this, that you have to renounce uh, either your material possessions or uh, kind of worldly connections or pleasure or something, you know, some, you know, or all of this uh, uh, and so on. So, uh, so it, it really, uh, renunciation is closely connected with a very common practice in Indo-European religions, which is asceticism, uh, which is really uh, becoming a monk or a nun. Uh, that, that, so, so that you really live a life of a complete uh, simplicity and sometimes poverty. Uh, you know, you would go out and beg for food and you know, like you basically renounce material possession as a path in life. Uh, so so uh, it's a radical form of kind of understanding the imprisonment and the dirtiness and the suffering of this world and so that you don't live it or you live it minimally so that then your next life becomes much better. Uh, so in Hinduism, typically you have a four stages of life, uh, you know, uh, dharma, dharma, you know, your destiny. And, um, uh, and you, you, you start your life by learning and you then become a householder and you retire after you've had your children and family. And then the last stage is actually renunciation. Um, pretty interesting. Um, coming back to um, Upanishads, um, uh, uh, many passages in Upanishads uh, this is uh, this is a cover of uh, a modern translation by Patrick Oliver. Uh, a very uh, it's fascinating read, and it's not <laughs> familiar. It's not kind of usual, uh, you know, reading that that they, that we read for theory and history. Um, but it's really fascinating. It gives us a lot of insights into ancient uh, Vedic uh, tradition and practices, and that that you find. Uh, an early form of asceticism and the notion of false reality, the contemplation of self, Atman, and the universal soul, um, Brahman. And Brahman is, you know, we, we talk about it in the context of truth, uh, liberation from perpetual uh, uh, reincarnation. So um, if you kind of attain to a certain degree of purity, then you would not become endlessly reincarnated in different life forms and you really transcend that reincarnation process. Uh, renunciation also means renunciation of worldly life that includes your family. You have to kind of, renunciation um, uh, also meant uh, almost like getting rid of your the biological uh, desires and tears uh, is um, the, the well-known story of Oregon, a Christian saint um, uh, who would uh, who was said to have castrated himself, and so that he would no longer be imprisoned by uh, his sexual desire. Um, so that's. An important feature, and that has a lot of implications. Uh, I want to move to another feature, which is uh, to do with um, uh, making gods human like, anthropomorphic gods. And they look, sound, behave like human, except more powerful. And in a typical uh, 
uh, kind of Vedic ritual. Um, I'm not sure how, I'm sure there are variations and here's one picture that showing, uh, that shows um, uh, the, the Vedic ritual that's just handed down to us uh, pretty much today. Uh, you have many, many priests and gods and invoking a whole host of different gods, gods of nature, sun, wind, thunderstorm, and dawn, of society, uh, in terms of order, obligation, customs, and motivational gods, impellers, fashioners, or makers, and ritual gods like fire, drink, um, acne, and soma, which is uh, important to uh, many, many Vedic rituals throughout the year. And, uh, and Indra being almost like a very special God, very important, uh, very human-like, uh, despite his um, powers. And, you know, he was, you know, was born to a mother and father, and he was said to have uh, uh, gone into a rivalry uh, with his father and killing his father in the end. And he was a warrior, he was a priest. So, you know, these stories about Indra is just endless. It's really fascinating to think about Indra and then think about the Greek god of Zeus and, and, and its kind of Roman um, version called Jupiter. Um, uh, heads of families, the most powerful thunderbolts, uh, uh, powerful, but also they have vulnerabilities. They're, they're human-like. Uh, you know, here, here's really basically, you see the similarities across uh, vast distances uh, between India and Greece. And you also see similarities between this conception of, of a, a very powerful male god uh, with vulnerabilities and powers. Um, this is almost like a side note, but I thought it was really interesting uh, uh, that, that, that all Vedic rituals were performed with uh, the drinking of a stimulant drink called Soma. Uh, actually, today we don't know what the ancient soma was made of, and maybe it was made of a, some kind of plant or, or mushroom that really provided some kind of hallucination and made people really, really excited and, and you know, having vivid imaginations. Um, uh, it was kind of prepared carefully, uh, a very interesting uh, custom. Uh, that was also part of the Zoroastrian rituals and here are some instruments of how to, it, it was not called Soma, but Hauma. It's the same, uh, a similar kind of ceremony and similar uh, drinks. Um, it's interesting to see that and really the God of Soma and also the God of wine. Um, I guess the, the, the climate in Mediterranean, you know, wine certainly was more important in the Mediterranean and, and the alcoholic drinks also had, um, you know, similar kind of effect of intoxication and making people excited or, you know, having vivid imaginations. Um, uh, I, just in case I'm talking about this as, you know, as a flippant uh, side note, and I want to mention that Bertrand Russell in his, in his uh, 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 one of his major works, History of Western Philosophy, um, used this to describe a Dionysian spirit and the, 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 the Greek uh, god of Dionysus, uh, of course, is the god of wine but also God of enthusiasm and God of really creativity. And, um, and Bertrand Russell was saying that this is really so unique. It's actually not so unique. And if you, I, I, I don't know whether he was thinking about, you know, across different Indo-European civilizations, but he was certainly kind of praising the Greek civilization being so unique. And he said that nothing is so surprising 
also difficulty account for is the sudden rise of, of civilization in Greece. And that was the, his opening sentence of the history of Western philosophy. And so this really, it just shows that how important he, he really saw the Dionysian spirit uh, uh, in the Western civilization. It was a spirit that was stimulated by wine, by temporary loss of prudence that you became, you know, uh, completely uh, infused with certain ideas and you're driven by a huge amount of energy to do something. Uh, and this, you know, this is really quite, quite a unique feature. Uh, I, I do agree with uh, Bertrand Russell. Uh, I guess in China, drinking seems to be an act of kind of escaping something. Um, but in ancient India and in Greece, drinking was almost like becoming godlike. Um, and, you know, you, you, you're able to kind of momentarily connect with higher spirits. Oh, so <laughs> uh, in, in Western paintings, you see a lot of, you know, Bacchus is, uh, is the, the Roman version of Dionysus. Uh, and also thinking about today's contemporary expression of uh, nightclubs and disco parties of alcohol and drugs and the three minute song. Uh, this, maybe this is, this is kind of the, you know, the final trace of the ancient uh, tradition of, of uh, drinking stimulant uh, drinks and, and producing enthusiasm uh, for whatever. Uh, here is enthusiasm for nothing. Um, the last uh, uh, kind of thought language implication I want to talk about is uh, extra familial life. This is hugely important. And to me that this is probably uh, the most important feature that, that, that made uh, European cities uh, so different from Chinese cities, at least. Um, and this is uh, in a way captured both by the figure of Indra. I just talked about that Indra had a rivalry with the father, he actually killed the father, and also the Greek mythology of Oedipus, who did the same thing. Uh, uh, that, that although you know, it was done uh, not consciously, but it was this kind of father killing story uh, that, that really became, at least to Sigmund Freud, uh, a cultural feature that, that somehow, I think sometimes, you know, in academia, we are saying to students that you've got to kill your intellectual father in a way that you have to leave your teachers and universities so that you can become yourself. So here's the thing that, that, that in the Chinese context, home is always there. Somehow throughout your life, you could be understood as never having left home because you go from home, you go to university and you go to Dan Wei, uh, you end up being in a kind of um, a similar kinds of institutions and in, uh, in the religious uh, tradition of you know, many Indo-European religions, you leave home to become a monk. You leave home to stay in a cave. And you, you know, this is a Jonta cave in, uh, uh, in India. And also, you, know, you leave home in, to go to a desert. Um, this is where the famous Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Um, but this is quite uh, well known that, that many Christian, early Christian uh, uh, saints uh, went to the desert and they basically go into a church, go into a monastery, is to renounce the family duties and the duty to produce children to carry uh, through the family line. Um, and to become something else. So, so this is this is something you know I describe it as the extra familial. It's like leaving home, and this is uh, quite 
uh, central to uh, this whole setup that I've been describing in the last, uh, probably last hour now. Um, so we have extra familial institutions uh, as monasteries, uh, Saint Benedict was the in the kind of European tradition uh, first to, and there are many kind of mon monastic uh, forms in India as well, uh, in Jainism and in uh, and Buddhism. Uh, the uh, the European version of that is is uh, first established by Saint Benedict uh, um, as a um, Benedictine monastery. Uh, this is um, the site of one of the earliest, uh, this is a re reconstruction of a, one of the earliest Benedictine monasteries um, that was constructed spatially, architecturally as an institution that's not family. Um, uh, you know, think about that, you know, like, constructing something that's not family. And the Greeks had already done that. And the Christian also, Christians also did it in terms of uh, monastery and uh, cultivation in that context of study, uh, of research, of accumulation of classical texts and so on. Uh, this is the reason why we have so many texts that surviving from uh, civilization from the earlier part of you know, Indo-European civilization, at least in, in Europe, when you look at the city like this, it is made of homes, but also it is made of institutions that are not homes. Um, so institutions that may look like this, and none of this is actually, these are cloisters, and this is uh, Cambridge University, these are cloisters um, that served as, as extra familial institutions that cultivated uh, some degree of um, um, equality. Um, so uh, just in case you think that this is a casual uh, observation, uh, no, this is not, this has been talked about over and over again, starting from Aristotle. And he said that the whole point of setting up cities is that cities, uh, even the smallest cities, uh, compared with the largest family, even if the sizes are similar, the smallest cities would still have an advantage of a place of equality, of truth, uh, of, of, uh, of real beauty. Um, Max Weber, a uh, very influential German sociologist uh, in early 20th century, uh, wrote, he actually wrote um, a really interesting book called The City, uh, describing precisely this function. And he was able to also say something which I think is extremely interesting about the difference between Chinese cities and Western cities is that the Chinese cities uh, lacked the oath bound confederations. Uh, so, you know, the Ch ancient Chinese cities are all based on blood bound kinships and, and, and uh, you know, kind of versions of the family and oath bound confederations are different. You know, they're like going to monasteries and you really renounce something and you go into uh, a guild, a production guild or skills guild or, you know, some kind of knowledge guild or you enter into some kind of brotherhood. Uh, so, so you, you pledge loyalty to that confederation through uh, oath. Um, so you you know like sometimes you, you see that oath uh, um, pledging uh, in in kind of social institutions or even national identities is based on that uh, as well. Uh, very interesting um, observation and and. and uh, that really makes a, a big difference in terms of how um, European cities um, have been developing and, and developing features that look and, and experience uh, so 
uh, differently from how you, you know, you experience a Chinese city. Uh, so that would be uh, uh, something that, that also applies to clubs and public institutions and to open space and church, mosques and synagogues and universities. Um, uh, as, as I was saying earlier that that actually, if you look at the traditional Chinese uh, public, well, not public, imperial institutions, and they, they tend to look like families, you know, even the imperial court is almost like a family court. And the, the ministry is a, a different kind of smaller versions of that. Uh, uh, they uh, even book collections, you know, we want to say they're libraries, but then they're not. They were not libraries, you know, they're uh, they kind of Changshu Lo means that the place where books are kind of hidden as private collections, you know, education, book collection, and, and all kinds of things uh, uh, could be imagined as a, as a, as a kind of family-like institutions. If you're interested in this, and um, uh, uh, Ye Wenxin has a uh, this is a professor in uh, California uh, of uh, Chinese studies and wrote a book called the Alienated Academy uh, that who you know it's a book that that describes um, really interesting developments of uh, of scholarly traditions in China where uh, the family like structure influenced how the rivalry between different schools and the rivalry between different uh, uh, collections and so on uh, shaped the, the development of Chinese knowledge and how that changed uh, in the 20th century uh, uh, in response to um, Indo-European influences from um, uh, other places. So, um, we are today basically living in the consequence of uh, the Greek and European synthesis of all of this. And I need to move uh, maybe a little bit faster um, in the sense that, that uh, there has been an integration of all of the above from imprisonment, conception to purification, to renunciation and asceticism, and to uh, anthropomorphic gods, uh, and, and combining all this with uh, strong scientific and, and technological and institutional developments and becoming enormously uh, influential and enormously uh, powerful and uh, enabling uh, centuries of colonization uh, that uh, uh, spread around the world. Um, I guess talking about synthesis, nobody is better than Raphael. <laughs> he, he said, as a young man, he was able to kind of put so many different things together. And this is, of course, you know, one of his uh, very famous painting. Uh, I want to, well, look at this painting. Uh, you know, the center group is actually in conversation. They're not reading anything. I know Plato and Aristotle are holding books, but they are reading books. They're actually debating. Uh, there are other people around who are reading and writing. But the, cent the, the central image uh, is really about a conversation. And one want to kind of imagine what, you know, what are they talking about right now? And what is orally debated? And I would like to imagine that perhaps they are actually talking about an ideal city, architecture theory, and maybe because they are in this uh, wonderful structure that was imagined by um, uh, that, that, that building behind them you know, didn't exist and maybe uh, it's derived from maybe Bramante's uh, designs or something. Maybe they're talking about buildings, maybe really talking about abstract idealized cities, mathematical proportions, uh, uh, the architecture of inflection that we uh, talked about yesterday, uh, idealized functional planning through zoning or clear divide between nature and human. Uh, all of this characterize uh, 
a lot of the architectural theorizing uh, from ideal cities like Palma Nova to um, Claude Nicolas Ledoux, uh, this uh, Royal Salt Works uh, in the 18th century, to the idea of the garden city as idealized versions of life uh, that, that um, uh, that's to be protected and created by uh, architecture or even the kind of display of the achievement of the, uh, I guess the American accumulation of the grand achievement of Indo-European civilization. And this is the National Mall in Washington DC with all the museums and documenting uh, human progress uh, and achievements. Um, I, <laughs> Every year I run a studio somewhere along this national mall. I thought that this is really quite amazingly powerful space. And this precise this space where you can uh, insert some kind of, you know, uh, rethinking and reimagination. Uh, it is powerful, really, it is powerful. You know, it really conditions architecture, philosophy, but also down to something like food, you know, like um, what is it that makes us think that all vegetables should look the same? We actually do it, you know, we, I mean, this is a very typical picture when you go to, to a supermarket today, uh, all over the world actually, that, that, that there clearly has been a cultivation and selection and preservation and transport, transportation that made them look exactly the same. We know that in the biological world, vegetables don't look like this, but they are created like this. Uh, it is really kind of little utopias of air conditioning, of aesthetic appeal, of perfection, of capitalism. Uh, they are globally sourced and chemically enhanced efficiently produced and so on and so forth. Um, um, so the equivalent of the vegetables would be grammatized abstractions. Uh, so here is some example. I mean, I don't really need to go through too many of this because we are, you know, this is the part of the architectural theory that we're all familiar with. Uh, so I don't want to uh, at least too much time to talk about this. Uh, suffice to say that if you look at this grand kind of ancient scheme, and then you look at the grammatized abstractions, which uh, we discussed yesterday with uh, Philip at the end of the lecture, and you get this, you know, like these are the kind of um, uh, permutations of abstracted spaces uh, that basically is making references to itself as, as spatial and mathematical systems. Um, I want to show you two uh, pieces of artwork, and one is a photography by Andrew Agusky. Uh, it's called 99 Cent. Uh, those of you actually familiar with um, uh, the kind of retail culture where I come from, I mean, I live, um, uh, uh, we have this 99 cent stores that basically has huge amount of cheap food that's produced. Uh, I want to say that, that they are inflected food, inflected and idealized food. They're actually produced to maximize taste texture, uh, uh, you know, that to induce the maximum amount of pleasure. Uh, this is really quite incredible that we produce so much of it, uh, that, that people eat so much of it. And the second art piece is by John Isaacs. It's called The Matrix of Amnesia. It's a fiberglass installation uh, that, <laughs> that to me is, a paradox. It is really the body, the human body as a waste. It's like a human body as a wasteland, resulting from this abundance of inflected and idealized food. Um, 
what is really a, a bit scary, uh, a bit threatening, is that this wasteland that's represented by uh, this fiberglass body that's spread around the floor uh, will ultimately be our planet. You know, we think that we have produced plenty of commodities to sustain us, but actually we are also producing a wasteland uh, in which uh, the life will basically end itself at some point. So that brings me to the limits of possessive individualism. I want to uh, highly recommend and introduce a work uh, called The Political Theory of Possessive Individualism from Hobbes to Locke uh, by C.B. McPherson. And this is not a very longitudinal study of long periods of history, but more like focused on a particular mode and a particular kind of maybe European and American synthesis of, uh, of the the uh, Indo-European civilization uh, culminating into a way of life uh, that has become the standard uh, today. And sometimes you want to say this is uh, named as the American dream. Um, uh, it is something that, that we all need to think about uh, carefully. It has a great promise. Great promise is that cities as protection of free will in its fulfillment. Great. And it also has a great pitfall. Possessive individual with original rights, and, and that's really important conception, uh, abstracting and purifying his or her settings, orchestrated by capitalism without regard to the environment. So this is really the double-edged sword that we have today, that the enormous success of Indo-European civilization grounded in phonocentrism, grounded in this kind of sophisticated, very persuasive, very powerful uh, linguistic philosophical construct uh, has spread around the world. And then we are facing the other side of the edge, which is uh, uh, the edge that basically uh, uh, of damage, of uh, over purification, um, of over ma manipulation of, um, of the things around the world and, and, and most importantly, of kind of excessive imagination of the abstracted, grammatized, utopias uh, that we're pursuing at the expense of the planet that we have today. So uh, to think about this, so this is the end of today's uh, lecture. And tomorrow we'll uh, basically uh, do a similar thing, but um, probably with a different kind of structure um, in terms of uh, how this whole kind of enterprise can be uh, thought about uh, differently. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And very interesting topic today. Uh, I think she um, uh, has a very strong um, uh, culture and the philosophy research background and give us uh, a lot of um, uh, information, knowledge, and we need to uh, thinking a lot um, based on this kind of uh, conclusion in your last slide. I think uh, you, you mentioned about um, from the Indo-English uh, 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 language system, it's uh, produce a kind of um, simplification. This simplification may be from uh, the mono theme in the history and purify it to a a special beliefs and a special living style, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 the the priest, uh, 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 the Western belief. Actually, it's kind of a culture from Indra to Jos, for example. It's mm -hmm. kind of believings and showing also, including some 
um, some extra family life, uh, uh, living the home. And uh, uh, I think this kind of culture will visit different, um, uh, 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 different uh, Christ, Christine um, space uh, church. Uh, that's mm -hmm. uh, present, like La Cupsia also in her, when, when La Cupsia start the globe, the, 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 the super tour of his life. He also visit one of the Christine and uh, make research of kind this kind of uh, purify space for the monk or for the uh, yeah the, the design a lot of red <laughs> it's just really a lot of, red. Kind of uh, culture orientation <laughs> yeah culture orientation especially for the uh, autonomous of modernism you mentioned the um uh, uh, I think the modernism actually is from this kind of purification. I think it's a it's a so culture. That, that's, it's that's a Bruno Latour. Yeah, I think Bruno Latour has really done a great job describing. Mm -hmm. What I want to add is that purification mm -hmm. is not modern, mm -hmm. ancient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they really take that particular thought language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, uh, we need time to understand, but uh, thinking about that on that, and also at the beginning of the lecture, you mentioned the high degree of the the graphic uh, redundancy. Yeah. I think that's very interesting about redundancy because the like Chinese um, character or Chinese calligraphy writing, they have a kind of a graphic uh, 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 representation of the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, redundancy. But actually, which is quite uh, relative, uh, correlate to the topic simplification or purification. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think say from uh, this, um, uh, which is a kind of paradox to the mono uh, 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 symbolic, uh, mono symbolic uh, procession. Uh, uh, to represent this kind of language. So different language system, which is going, one is going yeah. to... Yeah. Into the the is you want to trace, mm. you want to trace a little bit more, sorry, I'm, I'm getting an echo here. If you want to trace that argument, it's William Hanna's, uh, and what, what, what he was arguing is that basically he said that Chinese language is an phonetic system. Uh, you know, alphabet is basically a uh, uh, low degree of redundancy or no redundancy. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and the Chinese has a lot of redundancy. Uh, because you actually use extra lines and extra shapes and to indicate something that can be mm -hmm. done. Quite simply. Interesting. It's really interesting as a critical perspective. We're thinking yeah, on totally, uh, totally. <laughs> his criticism didn't stop there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's an interesting yeah. point, I guess. It, it really is 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 uh it's a, I think that he's wrong, he's totally wrong. He's uh, you know, it's uh, that's what I mean by phonocentrism, because it is a criticism that comes from a particular mm. prejudice. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. Um, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. From yeah. this linguistic perspective to thinking on, uh, on the, uh, this, uh, this modernism, uh, what is modernism and what's the, uh, we should be thinking the problem of modernism, which mm -hmm. uh, at the end of your, this lecture you mentioned, maybe it's over purification. Uh, uh, it, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Modernism maybe give us like, uh, the simplification or purification uh, represent the modernism thinking, but actually, uh, which relate to the planet, relate to our um, uh, uh, like. I, I like the 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 uh, the, the artistic uh, image you and the art uh, image you're showing. Uh, oh, the, you. <laughs> I love that. It's, yeah, it's it's very yeah. critical. I think uh, to it's ironic. To, it's ironic. So that's about purification and it's, you know, what it does actually it has, you know, if, if the first image is a utopia of cheap, you know, tasty food, and the second image is dystopia is the opposite of uh, mm -hmm. utopia, which is always a double uh, in all utopian pursuits. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, I, I think, uh, I mean, my 
goal here is really to recontextualize Latour's criticism of modernism to say that it is actually an ancient sensibility, mm -hmm. not a modern one. Yeah. It's 4,000 years old and rather than 400 years old. Mm -hmm. And it is actually uh, something that, that we should, you know, uh, we should think, if we want to think against it, we have to be able to say that the world is not dirty. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. very simple. Mm -hmm. This world is not dirty. Can we think like that? Yeah, interesting. You know, it is totally interesting. It's actually very simple. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. oh, man, this kind of tradition, this mm -hmm. 4,000 years of tradition mm -hmm. is is amazingly gripping in terms mm -hmm. of uh, our imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing is, I think you mentioned last time, uh, yesterday, but today, uh, you, you, you also uh, talk about the oral uh, anxiety and the oral representation of the, uh, the thoughts um, from different culture or different linguist perspective. Mm -hmm. And also you mentioned the difference between the oral and the writing. Now, could you add in something which can um, relate to this kind of abundancy and the purification uh, uh, paradox uh, between the oral and the writing? Uh, do you have any, uh, adding any? Well, I think there are, there are two different problems. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think uh, the reason why I think alphabet was, has been deliberately kept simple mm -hmm and shapeless mm -hmm. is because it really, it's used to preserve orality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. because that's the least distracting way to note the sound down without shapes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that you focus on the sound. Okay. Mm -hmm. You don't think about shapes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, so that's not oral. Really, that's oral. <laughs> like yeah, the, it's your oral. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's writing, but mm -hmm. it's kind of you know, it's it's the compromise. You know, the, the least satisfying. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I think I think the ancient Indians and decided that we just don't write. Mm -hmm. Or Socrates, you know, decided that I'm not going to write. Um, but Plato did. Uh, mm -hmm. But he used the alphabet. So the Greek alphabet was. You have to say that it is really ingenious invention and it's just amazing um, that, that it was created. Um, and we don't think about it because we use it every day, but, but, but uh, it was not a, you know, it was certainly not a, a inevitable development. You know, it was an invention that was just completely uh, incredible. Uh, so was the Chinese writing, you know, it was an invention that is yes. more connected with things, but it's also really incredible. So, so this is really, that it comes back to what I said in the beginning, that, that we're not saying that one should be promoted at the expense of the other, but we should just need to understand the gap. The gap is huge. Yeah. Also, and, you mentioned the Indo-European um, language uh, also uh, uh, I, I forgot who who who, who says uh, the uh, the the hero graphic was before the letters right yes that's and, just um, yeah that just like uh, the the parable were before the the augments so yes. that's a very um, uh, interesting to present uh, the difference I think um, Yes, yeah, uh, that's translated. It's a hierographic. Uh, I think it's it's much more um, abundant, abundant compared to the the alphabet letters. Yes, uh, but it's pure. It's it's before actually from the linguistic perspective. It's before the letters actually, but it's directly growing to a, 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 well, yeah, a language and also the, that's yeah. that's Bacon's story. Uh, oh, but the thing can, yeah. is that the Chinese characters, if you look at the Jagu one, you know, mm -hmm. it's probably at the same time as the alphabet. Mm -hmm. It's not before and after, it's comparable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, Bacon, 
Uh, bacon is actually quite amazing. I, I, you know, my whole, uh, you know, this power and virtual book that you you mentioned in the beginning. Uh, there's a lot of Francis Bacon in there. Uh, mm -hmm. I know. I mean, like I've read that book many times. I, you know, because of the book, um, uh, he he really kind of thought very clearly, um, but uh, but clearly from a kind of intellectual tradition of the, you know, Indo-European civilization that I've been describing. Um, uh, yes, of course, yeah. Uh, if you follow that line of thinking, that is the conclusion that, mm -hmm. that hieroglyphics is, is, is basically primitive and then right. off that is more advanced. Mm -hmm. Interesting, very interesting. Terrible, <laughs> the primitive, and arguments are advanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a, the book is called Advance of, Advancement of Learning. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's 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 one of the key texts. You know, if there are actually two texts in Western intellectual development, it will be the Rene Descartes' Discourse and Francis Bacon's Advancement of Learning. Okay. Yeah, Francis Bacon. Yes, I remember um, uh, Stanford Anderson. Uh, I, I I used to be um, one semester uh, working as the assistant of, uh, of his uh, theoretical courses. He actually um, uh, in MIT historical uh, 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 theoretical course, courses mm -hmm. to PhD candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, a really special research on Francis Bacon. Theory. I still remember that uh, more than ten years. Yeah. Ago. He's, he's a good writer. He's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I think you know our task. I mean, I, you know, my task is extremely complicated, mm -hmm. and I have to say, uh, mm -hmm. if you know, there's anything that that doesn't make sense in your minds, please raise it, mm -hmm. and please talk about it because you know, there's no ready solution here it, you know we are putting you know i'm trying to put together um, a lot of things uh, uh, not repeating structuralism but or not repeating post-structuralism mm -hmm. but really be able to kind of integrate um, uh, chinese thought uh, mm -hmm. internationally you know so so that they start simultaneously rather than Chinese thought being a specialized area. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's really is the danger because we also always, you know, like in the world of English scholarship and you have experts talking about Chinese philosophy, mm -hmm. but, but you, you don't, you know, you don't really understand anything. <laughs> They're just repeating what, whatever who said what, you know, yeah, I think that's a special part for you. Um, uh, you, you really understand both, right? The philosophy of uh, the the China from China, and also the, you know the theory is another matter. Yeah, mm -hmm. really is. Also, I remember today as another interesting point you mentioned the isolation from the family and also the family understanding from China, from Eastern world. Uh, the archetype actually is quite different to the to the west oh yeah yeah that's the very interesting also uh, could be a phd uh, study <laughs> well, because, yeah. because you know it, uh, the is, is a, it was a it was a theme mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was only possible after the may 4th movement you know uh, mm -hmm. you know it, uh, you, you know this this um the May 4th intellectuals that loved that Norwegian play called Nora. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And it was really about Nora leaving home. Mm -hmm. So courageous. It really <laughs> touched the Chinese hearts. Mm -hmm. How can you actually leave home? <laughs> exactly. You don't leave home. You only go to Danway, you know? Like, yeah. yeah. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a family again. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So that's really incredibly interesting. There mm -hmm. are multiple institutions in 
like a European society, American society, where you can leave home and then become something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Aristotle. It's, yeah. That's, it's politics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Aristotle is politics. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's, yeah. Fascinating. So Chao, do you have any question uh, from the floor, from students you want to put forward? Well, I think if you want, you need some time to think about all this. Yeah, we need time to think about everything. So it's interesting. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, remarkable points we need to uh, think about and uh, also to the students, especially PhD yeah, candidates. Uh, uh, do a lot of- Reach out to, to Chao or Yan Chao or to Philip or to me, uh, uh, you know, email is the best way. I, yeah. The thing about this form is that it's convenient, but I, I don't see students. I don't see their face, <laughs> I don't see their reactions. Um, I, want, uh, I hope what I say makes sense. And if it doesn't, then please, you know, kind of mm -hmm. come and discuss. And, you know, as I say that, that, that what I'm attempting here is, is very complex, mm -hmm. um, but very important. Good. Uh, so, so remember that. Yeah. Chao, oh, are you here? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I think for for the students, you you have any questions, or you you don't have any questions right now, but you can just sink into those thinkings and maybe come back tomorrow, and we can also continue the discussion. Yes. Yeah. And think about it, and then then raise some questions tomorrow. Yeah. Good. Okay. That's great. So I think uh, today is here, uh, uh, we, maybe we should uh, stop here. So thanks a lot for uh, Xiao's uh, lecture. I think it's a great opportunity for us to understand um, uh, the, the, uh, from the language and architecture. It's a new perspective to us to rethinking on the Western and Eastern uh, from the language perspective. So, um, Oh, there, yeah. there is a question. There. Yeah, there's, there's a question. yeah. Mm -hmm. The gap, yeah. You brought up between the West and the East is similar to the tours, the Middle Kingdom. You said there. Tomorrow, is... can I uh, talk about that tomorrow? Uh, this is Tong Tong, right? Yeah. Can and I talk Chong. about? I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. The... Oh, great. The, the, I think the key word from Latour is uh, diplomacy. Uh -huh. Yeah. So diplomacy is about really shuttling between the gap. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll talk about that tomorrow, okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, also about, uh, I don't know whether I'm able to talk about Tongjin, but certainly landscape uh, uh, and 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 grilling and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay, he says, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That's yeah. a remarkable factor, and thank you. Yeah, uh, okay, so I hope one day I'll see your faces. And, yeah, uh, tomorrow. Uh, actually, I, I, tomorrow I have a, a final defense. Um, I need to be the jury for the mm -hmm. anniversary from age to uh, uh, to, to late night and the whole okay. day. Okay. So tomorrow, uh, Chao will uh, uh, moderate. Uh, okay. Actually, I will, I will, I will uh, uh, listen to your lecture from the YouTube maybe <laughs> afterwards. Okay. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you. And then I'll talk to you all tomorrow. Mm -hmm. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.